Two o'clock rock here on Think Tech. That, that on Friday means likable science, and it means Ethan Allen, and all those things are connected. And he's with Prell. Uh, he's the chief scientist for Think Tech Hawaii. And we're talking about water, which is his favorite subject. We're going to call this update on water. But you know what's <clears throat> really interesting is we're, we're facing shortages. Certainly we're facing shortages in fossil fuel. We had one guest a couple days ago that uh, suggested in 50 years we'd be you know, scratching for oil. Mm -hmm. We had to figure something out. It's not just not an option, it's a requirement. And there's so many other things, but water, you know, we have taken for granted, especially in Hawaii, where it is so cheap per gallon still, um, but in a few years, it won't be. All these forces are bearing on it. In other places, it's much worse. So we need to have an update on water. Absolutely. Water is critical to life, um, and including ours, you know, you can't escape that. Uh, and But other people in the world, there'll be wars over water one of these days, and uh, we'd better get smart about it. Not for you and me, Ethan, but for the next generation. Absolutely. That's you guys. You better be thinking <laughs> about this. No kidding. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that Ethan does, it, it takes his travels all across the Pacific Ocean, like Michener. Uh, <laughs> seeing all the places that Michener has seen, saw rather, he's, he's gone. Um, uh, but water is among the things he does. So what's your latest uh, Water for Life? That's a project you're working on. What is that? So in my main Water for Life project funded by the National Science Foundation, we work with communities across Micronesia from eastern Micronesia, that is the Marshall Islands, through the Federated States of Micronesia, out to western Micronesia, Palau, and help communities build better access to good drinking water, to good high quality drinking water for their, for their communities. And at the same time, we use water as a, a very effective hook to start getting people interested in science education. Because water has all kinds of science. There's physics in water. There's chemistry of water. There's biology of water. There's geology, hydrology, ocean science, atmospheric and the science. And the science of making water. Yeah, exactly. Which is going to be really important. Exactly. Exactly. Or purifying water, really, is, is yeah. the, the big yeah. issue, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so what does that pro program do? Is it all about science? It, it is. It's fundamentally a science education program, uh, although as my, my program officer at National Science Foundation sometimes says to me, it sounds like you're doing more community development than, than that, and science education. And it's it part of it, though. It is, very much. You know, I mean, it has to be on the ground. You have to show people. I mean, I think we, we need the same kind of education here, actually. Right. You, you know, it's nice in Micronesia, but it's also useful right here. Well, yeah, and this is, this is the, the thing I really wanted to talk about today is, is a related project. And I got a supplemental grant from National Science Foundation uh, to look at the, the sort of the nexus of food, energy, and water. And if you think about it, places like the Marshall Islands are very interesting. They have a bunch of water, they're surrounded by salt water, right? But it's not, not usable it's water. It's rising salt water. Uh, rising salt rising water, right? Salt water. That's going to affect the water table for sure. Right. They have very little water table in the Marshall Islands. It's very thin lens of water, a foot or two deep, some mm -hmm. in most places, and not very good water because it, it's often yeah. been washed over. They're going to have to ship it in or do right. something else. But they also have abundant solar energy, right? It's just constantly bright and sunny there. And so the question sort of is, why can't they do solar-powered desalinization, right? And it takes a lot of energy, huh? Yeah, they've got a lot of energy. They've got a lot of solar it energy. It takes a lot of money. And, well, no, that's... They don't that, have a lot that, of money. That's, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a trick. It doesn't take a lot of money. So we worked with uh, some folks from the University of South Pacific and from the College of the Marshall Islands and these, and particularly these kids from what, what they call it Life Skills Academy. You know, Life Skills Academy is sort of the Votech High School in the Marshall Islands. So the kids who can't make it into high school because they, their academic background isn't good enough to get them into high school. And they're That's basically really hard on the community to have people who don't go to high school. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a lose-lose situation. But we've got these kids now building these solar stills. And I'll show you in a little bit, we'll show a video on this. But so these are devices that use the sun's energy and you feed in salt water into them. And they basically- Desalinization? They, they run the water cycle. They basically cause evaporation, condensation, and, and then you gather up the fresh water that's, that's condensed. So here we've got this video running. And this shows uh, the leader of the project there. He's talking to the kids there. And they're starting to build this still, and I'll walk you through this. So there's it's not why, the, but you make me think of the South, you know, the, the deep South. The, and they got stills there. Yeah. Maybe they know a lot about uh, desalinization too. So these PVC putt frames and the, this hosing, which is just, just tubing, really just to support 
the external framework you'll see. So they're building this big long tube with these rigid supports on it made out of, as I say, just simple plastic housing held together with duct tape and string. I mean, there's nothing very elaborate here. And then they take this plastic, clear plastic sheath, basically, and string it over the whole thing. And you can see, so it's a long tube now, right? And you see the black plastic trays inside of it? They set it on a, on a slight tilt. And into that upper end, they pour salt water, which runs through those four trays. And then they close off. The salt water evaporates out of those trays, condenses on the clear plastic, settles to the bottom. And at the end of the day, you can pull fresh water out of it. Even if you had dirty, filthy salt water going in, you get absolutely clean, pure. Do you maintain it? I mean, do you, do you have a, a buildup of, uh, of you'd salt? Have, or? You'd have to empty the, the salt water itself out, you know, periodically and rinse it, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, basically, you see, you were talking at the expense of it. How, how much is that PVC pipe, that bit of hosing, a little duct tape, yeah. and a plastic sheathing going to cost? Yeah. And now they get. Where do they get? How do they take the energy from the, the solar and make this process happen? You put that device out in the sun. You just leave it outside. You just leave it outside. Yeah. There's no expense at all. No, no. Sun, you sun. don't need panels or anything nope. like that. No, nope. that's it's a it's a so how much capacity? You know, can I live off that thing? That basically that device that they showed there. You put about six or eight gallons of salt water into it in the morning, seawater, and you can take about a half a gallon of nice clean fresh water out of it at the end of the day. So if you had two of those, you could live off of that. So you probably need a couple of those or a bigger version of it. Well, can I put things in perspective now? Sure. Because before the show began, you gave me this, uh, this, this thing right. from she, uh, Loch Ness. Is, it, is that the name of the organization? <laughs> so Loch Ness has some stats for us on exactly how much water it takes to do this and that. And although the print may be a little small for me, maybe you can help people by telling them how much water it takes to do this and that. Well, so it's, it's funny, you know, we, th we think how much water do you really need? You need roughly half a gallon or a gallon a day to drink, basically. That doesn't sound like very much. You probably should be drinking more. Probably should be drinking more, particularly in a hot climate. Probably a couple of gallons a day would be a, really a better guess. Still, not a lot of water. But what people don't appreciate often is how much water is used in making other things. So, for instance... This is like energy. Yeah. How much energy, energy do we use to really create have, have make a cow right um, you know make a cow that we eat or right. or that gives milk it's a lot of energy right exactly so one of my favorite current examples is if you have a nice glass of wine that represents 32 gallons of water that one glass of wine your glass of orange juice may be only 25 gallons why so much well because you've got you've got to water the grapes You've got to wash things off. You've got to process it. You've got to clean the bottles. I mean, there's a bunch of water. So that's the that fresh, clean water. Are you, but you're not netting out for what's left as, uh, you know, used water, drain, drainage water, mm -hmm. gray, gray I mean, water. all that water has been used and has so been we, left. We get some of it back, though. Anyway, it's not lost forever. But you're talking about the fresh water we use, to in, you know, the first stage of these processes. Yeah? Right. But, I mean, water never goes away. The, the water molecules that you and I are drinking today, that are in that bottle of water you're drinking, are the same water molecules that were here in the age of the dinosaurs. And dinosaurs drank those same... You mean same somebody drank that water oh, before oh, me? Many people Could you tell me who it was? <laughs> I'd like to know. I'm, I want to be remain, remain clean on this. <laughs> it might have been somebody I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, lit literally, dinosaurs were drinking that same water, and cockroaches before the dinosaurs. And, I you know. like the dinosaurs, the cockroaches, <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> so, you know, the water just sort of goes around, and that's the beauty of that, actually, that solar still design. It really shows you that nice thing, that is, you, you put salt water in, the salt water Water evaporates off of out of the pan, condenses on the clear plastic, dribbles around the sides, collects in the bottom, and you're, you've got nice clean fresh water. And it doesn't matter what was in that salt water with it. There could be heavy metals, there could be pesticides, there could be bugs and all kinds. It's marvelous, of stuff, isn't it? But none of that evaporates out. Just so you don't, the water. Have to, you don't have to filter it. Nope. You don't have to process it. Nope. You don't have to heat it up or anything. It's well, the mm -hmm. purest possible. Yeah. H two O. Exactly. That's the only thing that evaporates out. It's only thing that condenses on. Are you missing something? I mean, water off water from the spring, right? Mm -hmm. and, Water that they advertise as really good bottled mm -hmm. water is not just H two O. No, there it's are the, all kinds of other. There, there are uh, small amounts of minerals and this and right. that. Right, there are small amounts of other things in it. Indeed, if you get very very pure water, it doesn't really taste very good to most people. If you if you try to drink distilled water, uh, it, it tastes sort of exceedingly bland to most yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. You want a little bit 
a few little salts, a few little odds and ends of things. Maybe somebody will come up with a little little envelope, a little a little mm -hmm. pouch or something, <laughs> and you pour these you know granules in there, and whoa, it tastes great. Well, I mean, by the time actually, of course, the water has run around in this in this plastic sheath. That's probably all, actually got a little salt and probably <laughs> spilled some of the, the earlier ocean water in it. And so it's going to not be absolutely pure, actually. Give us some more numbers. So one of my favorite stats is, well, let, let me say, let me, I said 32 gallons for a glass of wine. Seven, uh, 70 gallons, uh, no, sorry, 700 gallons to make a T-shirt. 2,000 gallons to make a pound of beef. Wow. Or a set of tires. That's wow. about, about the same thing. But, but one of my favorite stats in this is that they give you some, some messages about saving water in this. And they point out that if, if for a year, if each day during the course of a year, you forego a glass of milk, which takes like 52 gallons or 65 gallons to make a glass of milk, and instead drink a glass of beer instead of that milk, over the course of a year, you will save this planet over 15,000 gallons of water. You'll save 15,000 gallons. That's wonderful. Gallons. I know. We I should mean, all drink more wait beer. Wait till I tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have beer in the house forever now. I was going to say, get, get the kids off of milk. Of, you know? yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Start them drinking beer early. Why is that? Why is beer so cheap in terms of the input of water? Well, because beer, all you're really doing is the water to grow the hops and things, and then the water to put in to make the hops. For the milk, you've got to raise the water for the grass, water to raise the cow, then water to sterilize the milk and pressurize it. You know, I mean, there's a, a bunch of water used in the, in the process. Every, every step of the process is making milk. You know, I compared this to energy because, you know, people make the same kind of an analysis uh, for energy, how mm -hmm. much to, to, to raise a cow. Mm -hmm. But um, you know what? It, it's kind of the same thing because what the difference between water that's fresh and beautiful and water that is not so fresh and beautiful is it costs energy to make it fresh and beautiful again. Exactly. It's there, as you said, right. but you have to put some effort, some right. energy in to recreating the original purity. Right. I mean, if that's what you're looking for, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, nature does it for us all the time. The water cycle in nature, right? There's water constantly evaporating out of the ocean, as pure, pure H2O through the atmosphere, condensing into clouds. Of course, when it condenses, it's condensing typically around a little speck of dust, a salt crystal, something like that. So it's no, no longer quite pure, and then it falls, and as soon, of course, as soon as it hits a surface, then of course it picks up whatever's on that surface, any dust, any salt, any minerals that are soluble, and begins to get polluted again right away, basically. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, but then eventually it finds its way back down into the water table, into a lake or a stream, and then into the ocean, then evaporates out again, and. It just goes on and on forever. Well, the more pollution that we put in the water, it seems to me, the more energy we have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, invest in, in clean water. Exactly. And I remember when I first heard about Lake Baikal, you know, Lake right. Baikal sure. in Siberia. One-fifth one of all the liquid fresh water on Earth is in that one it's lake. It's fantastic. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I mean, for a long time, for, well, millennia, this was a huge and beautiful source of fresh water. Mm -hmm. But recently, and I don't mean more than 10, 15 years, um, it's, it's had some factories along the coast, mm -hmm. along the shore, and um, it's not so pure anymore, mm -hmm. and it's a real tragedy mm -hmm. that this huge so source of uh, mm -hmm. pure water that serves all of Siberia, that part of Russia, that part of the world, is now under attack. Uh, so, I mean, I think all places, it's, it's symbolic, all oh, places, oh. all yeah. freshwater sources are under attack in one way or the other. Humankind has taken over the planet in every corner, and so, yeah. We have to figure out ways to, you know, preserve, conserve, and ultimately reprocess it. Right. And that, to me, is the beauty of what I showed you there at the start yeah. of the video. Here is a simple, cheap, low-tech way. Any, anyone can basically make those stills. You, once you've seen that design, you realize, oh, yeah, there's nothing to that, right? I can, I can scratch up some uh, sheet of plastic, some, something to hold that plastic out into a tubular shape, something to make a tray for the middle of it, and then I've got it. I mean, as long as you've got some sunlight, you're, you're, you're set. That's the best kind of technology. Yeah, it's, it's not high-tech reverse osmosis kind of stuff, although, and later on we can talk a little bit about some very exciting developments in that, in that line, too. One, one short reference, though. Uh, I remember we, we did several shows with them. Um, this is a local company that went out into the developing world 
with a device that included just regular plumbing equipment, sort of like you know the device you're talking about, although it had one valve that was patented. And the idea was with regular plumbing pipes, they could run uh, water that was you know contaminated uh, on somebody's roof and um, use a solar, old-fashioned solar panel to heat it. Um, and um, and that you'd get clear water, mm -hmm. clean water. Um, and and this, this was unavailable in many places mm -hmm. in the world, uh, but it was only a few pipes, that's all it was. There were really no moving parts except this valve, uh, which was, you know, didn't require any maintenance. And um, they saved a lot of lives, I think, by providing fresh water where fresh water was not available. I'm not sure if they're still in business, but it was a wonderful idea. It was really a, a community contribution by them. There are very interesting things going on still with that kind of technology. Um, Dean, does the name Dean Kamen mean anything to you? Sure. U.S. First, the founder of the U.S. First Robotics Competition. Yeah. The guy who invented and, the syringe and, pumps, basically. And invented the, the Segway, right? Segway. Yeah. Right. So he, by the Segway, we got to take a break. Oh. We're going to take a Segway break. <laughs> we'll we'll be segue. right back. You'll see. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm fortunate to be able to host Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join in with us every Tuesday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. to see the interesting people we have to share with you their information. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to ThinkTech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. One. Bingo, we're back. We're back after that really lovely segue. <laughs> you wanted to say something more about Dean Kamen and segways? Right. So he's also now, uh, beyond the segway, has developed this machine he calls a slingshot. And it's a, it's a device the size of maybe two or three refrigerators a bunch of piping, basically. Nothing really revolutionary, but a very clever heat exchange system in it. And basically, with a, using about the power it takes to run a standard hair dryer, it can produce a thousand gallons of fresh water a day if you feed it seawater, basically. Wow. Um, so it's really an incredibly energy efficient machine, because you should be able to do that with solar power or whatever. <clears throat> that kind of technology is going to make somebody rich. Well, again, Dean Kamen, Doesn't he is rich. He is rich, but he doesn't really need the money. He's actually trying, what he's trying to do is get enough of these machines around the world so that he can afford to produce them en masse and produce them cheaply enough that they, they'll hopefully only cost a few thousand dollars each. And then yeah. basically any little remote Pacific island can probably get one. And suddenly they have a thousand gallons a day for, for an island of a couple hundred people. Yeah. is plenty of water, you know. Um, yeah, um, this is really, uh, this is the kind of thing we have to do now. Exactly. Um, we have to, you know, it'd be terrible to see people dying of thirst. Because thirst leads to disease and all okay. kinds of problems in quality yeah. of life. There is, on, on that list I sent you this morning, they point out something like every seven seconds in the world, a child is dying of, from some water-related illness. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the costs, uh, the economic costs of water-related illnesses are astronomical. <laughs> Uh, many cases uh, around the world, uh, water scarcity is causing far more deaths than wars and... And will uh, continue to oh, do that. Oh, it's and that's, and that's why the technology yeah. is so important and profitable. Right. <clears throat> Now, we, sp we spoke before the show about, uh, what is it, um, graphene. Yes. Graphene. If you don't know about graphene, it's time you looked up graphene. <laughs> uh, graphene is a, what is it, it's a, it's a layer of carbon atoms Right. one atom thick, and it recently discovered, <clears throat> and people are trying to commercialize it now. Why? Because it makes for a way better battery. So uh, you're going to see, maybe not in our lifetimes, but you're going to see 
Graphene batteries everywhere, and it's really going to change. You know, we were waiting for some extraordinary development in battery technology. Mm -hmm. It's here, and it'll get rolled out. And, right. you know, it's a sort of nanotechnology kind oh, of thing. Very much, yeah. Possibilities are unlimited. But you mentioned to me right. that graphene is not the only thing we deal with, we are going to deal with, that's one layer thick. There's also this perforine, right. a membrane that's one, what, one atom thick? One molecule one thick. One molecule thick. Right. Basically, and it basically is a... A, a sort of a specially structured graphene sheet that has pores built into it that are just the right size that they allow water molecules to slip through very easily, but because of the properties, it doesn't allow the, the charged uh, salt molecules, the, the sodium or chloride, to go through. And so, because it's so thin, literally they say, compared to a traditional membrane, if, 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 if your graphene, if your purple if your graphene membrane were as thick as a sheet of paper, a standard ultra-thin membrane would be as thick as a ream of paper. Or standard, standard today's membrane. So, I mean, that, that's the difference, is one to 500. So, and this means... Is it strong? The, will yeah, it be it, able it, to it, hold it, together it, in it, industrial it, uses? Exactly, and plus you don't need much pressure to push the water through it. The water flows through it very easily, and that means it doesn't foul up, and all the contaminants can be washed off of it very easily because they're not being jammed into it. Oh, so yeah. it lasts longer, it's cheaper, it uses Shame less energy. San Diego, they just put in I like $10 billion. Into our big um, reverse osmosis machines. Yeah. They'll be able to use these filters and probably cut their energy use by ah, okay. you know, a factor so of 10. San Diego is not yet lost. No, no, no. In fact, they could use this. Yeah. They're probably looking at it right now. And then, I mean, the, the big place where this is going to come into play is in China. China has committed and China needs desperately to, to do desalinization. China has this huge population on the coast, very limited water supplies, particularly in the north part of the country. They're way behind what, where they projected they would be on doing desalinization, and they, they desperately need to be doing this now to, to, to get enough water to run their industries, to keep their economy going, to keep their population yeah. healthy. And so they're also, and yeah, it's interesting that one of our defense contractors are the people who came up with this. Yeah, <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's the, the guy who controls the water he <laughs> has a huge strategic advantage. Oh, yeah. Right. And, and the Marshall Islands will benefit by it, you know, you, as you described them. Right. What about Hawaii? What about Red Hill? What uh, about, you know, all, we are going to have shortages too. Our aquifer is not doing that well. Well, one of the beauties here is, of course, UH just got their new EPSCORE grant from the National Science Foundation. This is a big grant to improve the whole research infrastructure. And for five years and $20 million, they are going to actually find out how much water we actually have on Oahu, how much fresh water, <laughs> which no one knows yet. We, how many employees we, does the state of Hawaii we, have? Never mind. <laughs> We, we can find that out, Jay. All I'm know, not sure we can. All we know right now about, about water here, we can tell you pretty accurately how much water we pump out of the ground. But we don't know how much water goes into the ground, and we don't know how much water is sitting in the ground. Especially because it's porous. You know, your it's lava rock par is porous. Parts of it are porous, parts of it are impermeable. No one quite knows how big those porous reservoirs are. You can find they're, this out? Yes, they're, they're now, these guys are going to be mapping this, modeling it, and really we'll be able, after five years, we hope to give a really good much more accurate estimate on it. You know, people say now, oh, we've got enough water for the next 30 years. Well, do you want, do you want to be sitting here 29 years from now, wondering like, huh, is tomorrow the big day when yeah. <laughs> suddenly well, all the pumps see, go tomorrow's dry? Tomorrow's the big day, so let's, let's work hard tonight right. and try yeah. to fix it by the morning. Yeah, no, so we should know. We should know, you know how much water there is. And we should be, you know, every home should be putting these, these same little kinds of home so simple solar stills in, you know, so, you know, you can be you off the grid for water, for at least your key drinking water. But you know, it's very interesting that <clears throat> we have this conversation because the same thing is happening in energy. You know, it used to be, um, and it still is mostly, uh, it's, a, it's a centralized system. Right. Where you have a, a utility company is sending out energy mm -hmm. in various, right. produces and distributes. Right. Energy. Now, oh, they call it distributed energy, you can do it yourself. Yeah. And um, I think more and more, it's, it's inevitable, more and more people right. can do that. And the same thing with water. Right. And it's great. I mean, and you, you see this in, in the electric grid now is a distributed grid here. Uh, and that's great. It's much more resilient. Uh, it's much less prone to single point failures. Single point failures don't mean as much because you've got multiple sources of input now. Yeah. Same thing with water systems. People should, wherever possible. Now, it's not always possible. When you're living in a high-rise building, clearly you sort of got to rely on the, the building's water system, which is hooked into the muni municipal system. 
But again, even there, there, there are things to do. They can set up catchment systems, so at least you're not using good, clean, pure city water to water the shrubs in the yard, right? You're using just rainwater, you know, and don't have to process it. That's water you're saving. I mean, there are a thousand ways to save water, and we, we need to make that much higher in people's consciousness. You bet. And, you know, the problem as in energy is going to be people don't like change. Mm -hmm. uh, they have assumed all these years that the lights would always be on, mm -hmm. um, that the, the, although the prices were high, they weren't going to get much higher. We didn't have any special bills to pay. And the same thing with water. We have good, clean mm -hmm. water, and it would always be there. Not. Not and it's not, it's not our fault individually, even as a community. It's just the way things are happening in the civilized world. Right. So I, w I was talking a few months ago with some people from the southwest of England, and they said it was just a couple of years ago they started getting in their communities water bills. Before that, water was free. So there was enough water around. Basically, the, the, the city, the community provided water to all of its residents at no charge. And finally, they have sort of like, ah, oh, hey, like, this, this stuff is costing us money to get this out, get it clean, yeah. get it to the people. We, we need to start making them pay for that. Yeah. You know? Get uh, used to it. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, just like energy, the, the cost of new grid equipment, the cost of all that technology that will make it more resilient, as you say, and um, give us um, a more reliable system, better quality power, which we need mm -hmm. for our better quality, uh, you know, appliances and uh, computer equipment. Um, same thing with water. Mm -hmm. so we're going to have to go and buy this equipment, and some of it's going to be high tech. And the more high tech, the more you know, the more water it can produce. Right, but the more, more efficiently water it takes to make, the more the water it takes to run. More power involved. <clears throat> yeah. it's not going to be cheap. And I think people have to get used to the fact that right now it's cheap, but coming, you know, coming soon, it'll be more and more expensive because that technology doesn't right. come free. Yeah, I mean, you, you watched what happened with the price of oil, right? It used to be low, 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 and then suddenly it poof, spiked right up back in the 70s. Think, think of water right now as being the pre-70s oil, you know? Yeah. And we're, we're coming to that arrow, and suddenly that spike is going to hit. Yeah. And okay, well, the lesson of the show, I think, is uh, number one, uh, drink beer, there but not too much, and, and you have to be, you know, the right age for that. You know, let's not get carried away. We're not recommending that anybody not qualified to drink beer should, should be drinking beer. There we beer. go. And two, don't drink petroleum. It's no good for you. Absolutely. <laughs> and three, be prepared for shortages in water and an increase in the cost of water going forward. But cheer up. Ethan will have the technology. He'll help us out. We'll have regular updates on the status of water in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Ethan. Thank you, Jay. Good talking to you as always. <laughs>